to begin with, I request Professor Prakash Vaidya to complete uh, the portion that he started discussing. And uh, after he is done, I would introduce the new topic related to actual presentations uh, in which I will indicate to you a set of talks available under Creative Commons, which you will have to listen to and prepare a summary report. The actual assignment will be given next week, but today I will be giving you a pilot assignment for your own benefit to understand what exactly we have in mind. So, Professor Vaidya, all yours. This whole section is looking empty. So I think these people should come forward. So first we will cover some portion which we left off last time. In grammar we saw most of the punctuation. By the way there is a world punctuation day which is 25th September every year. So you can look up that how important punctuation is considered. So, we will learn few more minor punctuations, one is apostrophe, So, apostrophe has main function that it indicates that some letters have been dropped. We saw some of these things like it is and it is. So, letter may be dropped initially in the word when the word will start with apostrophe, letter may be dropped in between when there will be apostrophe in between or letter may be dropped in the end, when it will come in the end. Normal confusion is between S of possessive case and apostrophe S. And S of plural, many people put apostrophe for plural, which should not be put. For possessive case, the apostrophe also indicate that something has been dropped. Historically, the suffix for possessive case was es. It has become shortened to s. Even now, for some words, we have to use es when S cannot be placed directly, but historically it was ES for all the words like kings, was written as this, the old, old spelling of king was KYNG and it was written as KYNG ES. So, when this E was dropped to indicate that the E has been dropped apostrophe came in there and it has remained historically.
uh, instead of a letter being dropped, if a word, a phrase or a sentence has been dropped, then how do you indicate it? Suppose you are quoting something and you find some things are interesting which you might highlight. In between things are not important, but you want to indicate that you are dropping those things. Otherwise, the sentences will not remain consistent. If you take out some sentences or some part in between and if you start reading, you will find that it does not make sense. So, the device to do that is called ellipsis. You must be knowing this, only you may not be knowing the name. Many times you must have seen text with some dot 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 followed by text. This dot 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 is called ellipsis. So, generally people tend to give as many dots as they can fit without bothering about some standardization. The standard for this is three dots, whether you have dropped one word or whether you have dropped many sentences. This is only a signal, it does not indicate how much matter you have dropped. So, it is always three dots. So, if you have dropped it within a sentence, this indicates that the sentence continues and some words have been dropped. This has to be full word, not letters. Sometimes you might drop a whole sentence. So, the previous sentence will end on a dot. then these three dots are to indicate ellipses. So, you will have to use four dots to indicate that previous sentence has ended and some full sentence or part of next sentence has been dropped. If you miss this dot, it means the same sentence continues. It is a signal to tell that the previous sentence is complete. Some people tend to use ellipses all over the place, whether three dots or more dots. That is because they are running out of thoughts. They have some patchy thoughts and to join them they use ellipses, but this is not a good practice because it gives a signal that your thoughts are not in continuation. So, it is only when you are purposefully dropping something, but you have the matter, it is not because you do not have the matter, then only you should use ellipses. but not to cover up the fact that you could not find the bridging sentences. You all got a sheet last time about paradoxes of communication. Did you think over this and do you have some comments on this? Uh, yeah, yeah, let them read. Okay. How many of you haven't at least brought that? <laughs> Okay, before you start reading, I will tell you something about how to recognize a paradox. Uh, Hello. Before you start reading, just listen to it for two minutes and then start reading. 
there was an old Hindi movie in which there was a master and his servant. So the master used to ask the servant about what happened or what is going to happen and he used to tell his opinion. The master used to say this is not possible. Then after some time it would turn out that whatever the servant was saying was right. So the fixed dialogue was that after the master asked the, master asked the servant, the servant would start with Sab mein sach bolunga to aap jhoot bolenge. Means if I tell you the truth, you will call it falsehood. But master used to say, phir bhi batao. Then he used to tell and master used to say, nahi nahi aise to ho nahi sakta hai. And then it used to turn out. That is paradox. That the first appearance, it appears false.
But can I expect people to be in time free? Can I expect you to take special, special measures? If you cannot exactly figure out what it takes for your content to come here, do it five times on a weekend and measure the average time. And why do we come up and then start working? <coughs> The whole world does it. Only we stupid Indians do not do it. We are not stupid, we are very smart. But we behave stupidly in front of the whole modern world. You know the standard code of Indian standard time. It's not normal. It's just not normal. Anyway, why maintaining time is important, far more important is the fact that the time must be utilized properly. For activities, it is meant to be under. So, not making this is not okay. Anyway, today I will definitely end up with an assignment which has to be submitted on next week or on next Thursday. That means you will definitely have to be pausing and pumping to make this process be okay. Okay. In Washington, there is a large diplomatic community, and you know that diplomatic community is, has its own rules and etiquettes. So, one prime etiquette is being on time. So, if a diplomat has an appointment at some other embassy or somewhere, he cannot be a minute too early. So, what do you do? Because for safety you have to go early. So, he will reach the area and in his car keep on circling to wait for that minute to arrive. And he cannot be a second too late. So, exactly when the minute finishes, he will press the bell. You see how much care people take for this. So, all the paradoxes listed here are which you have come across. We have studied this. That is why we gave this list to you. There are more paradoxes which we have not studied. So, we, are, we have not told them here. So, first is about writing, that writing requires corrections. It only, not only requires corrections, but it requires rewriting. You can define Writing equals rewriting. You have to keep on correcting, keep on rewriting even the content till you are satisfied that nothing better can be done. Just being good enough is not acceptable. So, all great writers, we have a feeling that they are creative and somehow they just put their pen to paper and start writing, which is not true. A majority of them are just plain hard workers. And it is because they are hard workers, they become great writers. There are many other people who have equivalent talent, but they are lazy. As Oscar Wilde once said, that poor grammar is an indication of laziness. And poor writing is also an indication of laziness, because you do not take time to rewrite it and refine it. For example, in one interview, Ernest Hemingway, the famous novelist, was asked whether he rewrites. So, he said extensively. For example, his novel Farewell to Arms, he said he wrote the last page 39 times. So, the interviewer asked him, was there some technical problem? He said, no, each of the versions was right. I did not get the words right to express what I wanted to. No wonder he became a famous author. You see, biography of any author, they will insist on the same thing, that it is hard work. So, writing requires corrections is the first thing we have to understand. 
then you can't detect your own error that we found. You can't detect even others errors that also we found because when we were given a one page write up, we could not detect all the errors. Then correction requires a special sign set that we saw that intuitively you cannot give on correct, do on correcting because other people would not understand and we learned that sign set also. It takes a lot of time to proofread. Typically, it takes about 20 minutes to write one A4 page and to correct one A4 page first pass you will take 20 minutes. If you just read it might take 3 to 5 minutes, you do not pay attention to the errors, but to read for errors it takes same amount of time that the writer took. So, if even if you are the author you will spend more time checking the errors and correcting than the original writing itself. The original writing will be a small proportion of the total time. Then after correction errors are still found. This is surprising to many people. For example, in industrial quality control, the Indian method is you cannot trust anybody what quality it is. So, you have an outgoing inspection, you have inspection department which is separate from the production department and they will do 100 percent inspection. When the product arrives at your customer, he cannot trust you. So, he has an incoming inspection department. So, he will again inspect 100 percent whatever is coming in. You might feel that with 200 percent inspections, what goes on the factory floor will be flawless. Experience tells that it is not true. Having 100 percent inspection does not ensure that the product has quality. If the product is to have quality, your production process must be controlled so that it does not produce defects. You cannot first produce defects and then keep on searching for them. So, the explanation technical explanation for this is we think that production is a kind of random process, but inspection is perfect, but inspection is also a process and like any process that is prone to errors. So, even if you try to do 100 percent inspection you will still make errors in inspection and you will give errors. So, this says that iterative procedure is required because we will just see what is the typical fault rate. Normally, in a raw manuscript we will have one error per line. Even this is lucky, why we are doing double spaced typing because we expect there to be more than one error per line and then we cannot indicate them in the margins, this you must have experienced. But average may be one per line and there may be 30 lines per page, so there will be 30 errors per page. If you do your first pass correction and you correct the errors indicated on the manuscript and retype it, means reprint it. Now, what do you expect to happen? Will it have 0 errors now? You will find that now you might find some error which you had missed. So, it will come down to 1 per page. If it is a 10 page manuscript, after this correction you will find that there is one error in the 10 pages. You have to still do it the third time and if it is a 100 page book, then you will have to do it the fourth time. This is the minimum number of times 
you have to do correction. And if you do not do even this, then you can imagine how the manuscript will look. If you do not reread it and correct it, it will be pretty bad. Now, the effect of this is you might say that since you are not not noticing the errors, others are not noticing the errors, they are understanding the meaning. So, why take the trouble app? After all, meaning is important. What is the counter argument to that? If meaning is important, why bother about form? The reason is our brain is quite forgiving. It corrects the errors while reading. So, it ignores the errors, even spelling mistakes, all other kinds of things and it extracts the correct meaning. So, that is why you find that even manuscripts with errors are read and understood. But the subtle effect is that the brain takes effort to mask these errors and such manuscript becomes irritating. So, you may be reading only one page, but your teacher or examiner has to read hundreds of pages and any of them will tell you how irritating it becomes. To see examination papers where first they have to bother about whether it is correctly written before trying to find error. So, in professions in which correct writing is important, half the energy is spent only on error correction. For example, in journalism courses, all they have to do is keep on writing on different topics. So, they might, they might have done their research, taken interview, thought up their own things. Then they write something and submit. What does the instructor do first? Assuming the student has corrected his own errors, the instructor first grammatical error. He marks them with the kind of symbols which we learnt and then he hands it back to the student without commenting on the content. Till grammatically the submission is correct, the instructor does not comment on the content at all. After it is error free, then he will start addressing the content, then he will point out more errors about the content, about how the paragraph should have been, how the thought proportion should have been. But before correcting grammatical errors, he does not even start it. And most of the time in journalism courses is in this back and forth of error correction. The final manuscript does not take time to read. In the olden days, you used to have a separate tribe called proofreaders. Each publisher or newspaper used to have a room full of people who used to do only proofreading. So, the authors could be careless because the proofreader would hopefully take care. But now, we have the era of desktop publishing where you are the author and you are the publisher, you are the proofreader. So, now we do not, we cannot rely on other people to do this. The present standard in journalism is that they do not have any proofreader. Whoever files the story, the reporter is responsible for accuracy of that. If you see policies of journals, even professional journals, they say that you have to submit a photo ready file in so and so format, no corrections will be done. If there are errors, they are to your account. In publishing, the author is responsible for all errors. After the publisher has typeset the manuscript and sent printouts to the author, author is supposed to check them and certify them that the proof is correct. 
normally this is done in duplicate. The author makes corrections on two copies, one he keeps himself and one is sent to the publisher. That later on there cannot be a dispute about whether the error was pointed out or not. In the olden days, you used to have errata. Have you seen this in any book? Errata is plural of erratum, that is error. So, there used to be an appendix called errata. Because after typesetting, the publisher might find some error, and in olden days it was not possible to reset the type. This, those errors would be listed in this with page number, line number, what is the <coughs> error, and what is the correct thing required. If there are only a few errors in the whole book, then now the convention is that there is no error to given. So, this alerts people. So, unless there are some substantial errors, there is no error to given, but the errors are noted and in the next printing, those are corrected. So, if you see international publishing, any book, any journal, any magazine, which is published to tight timelines, you will find not a single error in the whole publication. Now, you know the symbols and you know how to look for, you try to locate errors in any foreign publication. That is the standard of edited English. We, they have already achieved and they have done it so long ago that they do not even talk about it. It is presumed that it has to be error free. Since we are at an early stage, we have to learn this and set our benchmark high. So that we reach the same standard because when you publish your papers or your thesis goes for evaluation to some external examiner or you write articles or other things for the international audience, you will be expected to follow the same standard. So, best time to start is now. A yeah, couple of things I would like to quickly add before we move to this discussion. He indicated that you should set things in order whenever you publish any material or write a report for international audience. I strongly object to that. If we wish to set a high benchmark and become as good as anybody else in the world, I think we need to do it first for ourselves, for our own readership here. As I said, if we are not careful about everyone around us reaching the same high level mark, there is no point in fighting the global battle because we have lost it even before we started it. So we do it for ourselves first. You are all computer science students, so you relate to the importance of the production process, the error finding. Can you relate it to your software bugs, for example? So when you write programs, today it is fashionable to let compiler do all syntax checking. There was a time when we, we learned it that way, we had to write programs on a form and like proof editor, the team manager would read at it and would shout at you if there was a single error anywhere. Whereas today, you just do not bother while you type your program because you know implicitly that there is a proof editor sitting behind which is the compiler. And on an average, how many times you have to compile a program before you actually get it syntax error free? Any guess? Three times at least? More than that? Okay. The semantic errors start appearing later and those are the errors that we really care for, whether it is written production or whether it is a program. 
and how long does it take to correct semantic errors? How many times you have to run it? That is inspection, right? Testing. And any amount of testing cannot guarantee that the program is error free. It, it only guarantees that testing has not succeeded in finding a bug. When you release the program in production, the bug could be found as late as six months, one year later, even in big financial systems. So that is why the production process must ensure that you write the program correctly, both grammatically and semantically. In exactly the same fashion, when you write, that is the time when you have to pay attention. Now, this might come as a shock that if you write for 20 minutes, you need to spend 20 minutes in checking it. Nobody would have done that kind of checking, right? For any writing, one's, one's own writing also. In fact, you do so little writing that the question of checking does not arise later, perhaps. Anyway, so let me digress a bit and give you a writing assignment today. How many of you have heard of this? Technology, entertainment, and design. Can you raise your hands? If you have heard of this, quite a few. Those of you who have not heard about this, please raise your hands. I would like to know people who are not. There are some, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay. So, yeah, in fact, uh, I'm glad that I asked this question uh, because this is actually an extremely important initiative. It is called TED for Technology Entertainment Design. This was a group started in 1984 as a group of people who wanted to discuss something very peculiar. What was that? Ideas worth spreading. You know, all of us, when we read about either a novel or some newspaper report or something, we occasionally do come, come across an idea which we feel, ah, this is nice, and we talk about it to some friends. That is an idea worth spreading. Each one of us, depending upon one's own inclinations, likings, etc., etc., might like different ideas worth spreading. But curiously, a large number of people who are differently aligned in their approach in mind and thinking might still come around to say, ah, this particular idea is worth spreading. That means they all coalesce in saying this idea is good. And there are billions of human beings and there are millions of ideas and out of which thousands upon thousands are found by all humans to be worth spreading. So this is a group which started that activity in 1984 and they started arranging talks, an annual conference and talks. These talks are all 18-minute talks. This could be on absolutely any topic on the, on the earth, except that people should jointly feel that it's an idea worth spreading. These 18-minute talks were recorded and they started releasing them on a website which was set up in 2007. This was TED.com. Very recently, they now have new.ted.com. This is 2014. The site is still under construction. It has just been constructed. So actually, if you go to TED.com, they will advise you to go to new TED.com. The group also supports openness of knowledge of all kinds. So they do not work on anything that is proprietary. All talks, therefore, are released in open source under a Creative Commons license. 
how many of you are familiar with creative commons very few you have all heard of open source open source software that you are familiar with linux ubuntu whatever whatever now just like software has the notion of open source there are other creative things for which there is no equivalent for example uh, professor prakash with the mention of journalism if i show a simple one minute video clip of a film or to play a part of a music to explain something to the audience i would infringe upon the copyright of the original filmmaker and original uh, this thing. i have no freedom even to quote it for explaining further or to write a critique i certainly have no freedom to extract from it and give it to people or to take the whole thing and distribute it to people because i think it's a good idea because the original uh, ip owner who had probably made a cd or dvd will say my copyright and my commission you have to pay so in order to address these issues related to openness of knowledge in creative work a creative commons was formed commons is actually the name which is derived from the english commons which is uh, in india also we have this equivalent is it stands for common property of villagers like a common land for cattle to graze common water which the entire village owns there is no ownership by any individual that was the notion of commons and creative commons is a common uh, 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 what should i say property of everyone for the creative mind so this creative commons on the lines of open source created many licenses the first license is just a cc license creative commons that means i give it to creative commons i don't care how people use it the more popular licenses are by that is by attribution so you can use it distribute it do whatever you want to do with it but you have to attribute it to the original author so this particular creative work was done by so and so is what you have to acknowledge when you do. there are other classifications such as nc which stands for non commercial that means you can distribute it but nobody can sell it for profit if you don't say that people can even make money on it there are two other alternate associate uh, uh, qualifications that are possible to this license one is called share alike this is more like the gnu gpl license that means if you modify a creative work then whatever modification you have done must also be given in the same license to the whole world the other more restrictive form is nd which is no derivatives that means the original can be distributed can be freely used but you are not permitted to make derivative work the ted talks are released under creative commons by nc nd license they are all available here there is there the talks are in mostly in english but several talks are in different languages there are more than 1500 such talks i would like to show you a glimpse of one such talk but before that i will tell you the assignment there are 1500 talks now what you have to do between today and thursday morning before you come back is pick a talk of your choice each one in this is an individual assignment not a group assignment and since there are 1500 talks i'll be very surprised if 30 of you randomly choose the same talk it is like in the in the us uh, uh, airport security when after 911 they started randomly picking people for details security except that i and several other indians always got randomly picked at every airport so such randomness is not very conducive to health okay right now what you have to do is you have to listen to that talk it's an 18 minute talk listen very carefully listening is an art you have to listen to it very carefully then you have to write a summary of that talk in your own words you have to write a summary of that talk in your own words that should be about half a page summary 
You have to write one A4 sheet. Nothing should be beyond one A4 sheet. As usual, it will be a typed assignment, so you'll have to type it in. And top right hand side, you must have your roll number and name. And then you will give the reference to the TED talk, okay, whose talk it is. Then you will have about half a page of summary, half a page or three fourths of a page. As a, you can divide that A4 size page into two parts. One part is summary, and the second part is slightly tougher. You are critic on the on the whole talk. So summary is suppose is my talk, then you have to write in the first part the summary of what I have said. In the second part, what you have to say is what you think about what I have said. Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? What points made sense to you? What do you think is, is uh, useful to others? How do you think it should be taken further? Or what are your counter views? Not a big essay in just one paragraph. So summary and critique. Is that understood? Just these two. So let me quickly show you the glimpse of a, of a talk there. New.ted.com. You can read the details on, on the... Uh, uh, you may not be able to read this, but I would strongly suggest that spend additional 10, 15 minutes going through the list. There are topics of various kinds that are listed there. Most of the talks are very exciting talks. How many of you have uh, heard of uh, uh, the hole in the wall experiment? Professor Sugato Mitra, while working for NIT, did it in Delhi, and since then he has expanded it enormously. He was a TED Award winner speaker recently. In a Hubli conference, he spoke on the further work that he has done. He has opinions which are completely contrary to my own convictions. He says no teachers are required. He says students will learn better if you throw out all teachers. Maybe he has a point because students anyway don't come in time to the class. So teachers are not required for that. Okay, so this is the site. You choose a topic. Uh, please spend 10 minutes in choosing a topic, something which you can relate to, something which you can understand. Do not necessarily select topics only from technology and science. There are n number of things in life other than technology and science. And there are very, very interesting talks here. But as far as this course is concerned, the task is very simple. You have to listen to that talk. And you may, while listening to it, you might want to make notes. I will grant you that an 18 minutes talk might have to be heard twice in order to understand. That will take 36 minutes. You will take... 20 minutes to write the first A4 page, as Professor Vaidya has said, and you will take another 20 minutes to correct it. This is the composite assignment for this entire week, so that there is no subsequent assignment after next Thursday to be submitted in the next week. Next week is mid sem week, right? We, of course, will not hold any mid sem exam. So please utilize this time to do well in the other subjects for which you have to give the mid -sem. However, immediately after mid -sem, the actual activity will start. There will be another specific activity, a group activity, individual and a group activity, which will be given around these TED Talks. So this is a sample pilot assignment. This is an obligatory assignment. Submissions due next week. Uh, uh, no, sorry, this week, Thursday morning. The handwritten note, as usual, has to be submitted here in the classroom. No excuses this time. I know most of you do not have a lecture before 9.30. So please come at 9.15 if required. Drop your submissions here and take the class. And type in whatever you have written with corrections, of course, if you want, and submit it on the website. Okay? Thank you.